this has been long in the works and I'm very pleased to uh, introduce some people here that are have come specifically for the diversity in paleo roundtable discussion. I don't think everybody is all right. Is, is, no, is not everybody is here yet. We're going to have to make a uh, special is, announcement ah, to have everybody vacate the room. Um, <laughs> please vacate the stage if you are not specifically in that special guest tag. If, um, if you are a presenter and you are not on the panel, please leave the room. I also see paleo men there, for example. We need to get as many, many people here. up on stage as we can now. Let's see, anybody we missed? <laughs> Uh, remember, cameras are optional. We do not require them. If you feel comfortable, please do so. Yes. And I'd like to just put out a few ground rules that we're going to go for with this discussion. Um, we're all approaching this topic respectfully and in good faith. Um, you know, just I, just please try to be patient, be kind, and respectful to your fellow panelists. Um, not everyone that we invited was able to make it here. However, so... There, there were originally going to be quite a few more people that we reached out to. Uh, in any circumstances, we thank everyone who is able to attend now for coming, and uh, we're looking forward to some good discussion. Indeed. Also, we have, uh, 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 as a reminder, an intermission after this discussion. Discussion. So if we are feeling like we need a little bit more time, we can go into that. Uh, but yeah... Um... I think we start with a little bit of introductions going one by one how I see people here at the top. Please just say like one or two little sentences uh, about yourself. And uh, yeah, I think then we can really start into this. Uh, starting here with Paleo Man. Hi, uh, my name is Dalton Meyer. I'm a PhD student uh, at Yale University. I study the evolution of lizards um, and I'm excited to offer what perspective I can on kind of the state of things as I like, experience them in academia and how that might be changing for the better, hopefully. Um, thanks. Okay, Grace. Uh, my name is Grace Self. I'm a I'm the preparator at the Mammoth site. Um, and as a preparator, I wear many hats, but most of them involve being actively in contact with uh, <clears throat> fossils, making sure that they're going to uh, survive in storage, making sure that in our case, with our unique bone bed, that they can survive as an in-situ collection. So, um, I, I guess I'm th I'm the technician perspective here. <laughs> okay, Tyrant Lizard Queen. Okay, uh, my name is Amelia Zietlow. I'm a PhD candidate at the American Museum of Natural History in New York City, and I study mosasaurs. Um, so I guess the perspective that I can bring to this is the research side of things. Nice. Uh, Vasi. So I'm Vasi Samudra Devi. I'm a performance artist, theater actress, writer, editor, just various things based in Sri Lanka. I have a bachelor's in humanities and liberal arts from the University of Peradeniya and a master's in fine arts from RMIT University, which I've been, which I've been, which I started like last year. So I'm coming at this from a very different, from completely different discipline, but like still gonna add what I can because of the perspective. Okay, uh, Bijao. Uh, so my name is Bijao. Um, I'm a, an artist based in New York that is primarily focused in art and filmmaking. Uh, I'm so uh, a good amount of you have seen some of my work for some period of time now. I'm trying to expand a little bit more into filmmaking. That's what I'm going to school for right now. Uh, but yeah, um, that's a big influence in my work. And I, Love to bring that into uh, some of the things that I do as much as I can. Okay, Tess. Uh, hi, I'm Tess Gallagher. Uh, I'm a master's student at the University of Bristol. I'm studying paleobiology and specifically doing a project on Diplodocus skin. And uh, yeah, hopefully I can bring in some discussion on uh, graduate life, probably. <laughs> Uh, Benji. Hello. Oh my. Uh, hello, <laughs> my name is Benji Pazno. Uh, currently, I focus on gallery design for museums as well as sculptures and life re reconstructions. So I am bringing forward the more technical side of building a museum in working with scientists and other people to kind of bring that vision into the physical world. 
Okay, nice. Uh, Riley. Hi, I'm Riley Black. My pronouns are she, her, and I am the author of lots of different books about fossils and natural history, the last one being uh, The Last Days of the Dinosaurs. I've had bylines all over the place in National Geographic, Smithsonian, Sierra, things like that. But I also do a lot of field work over the past 11 years. I've been doing field work in places from like Alaska to northern Mexico, mostly in the Four Corners. And obviously a lot of what I come to in the intersection of diversity and paleo has to do with being transgender and also being autistic. Uh, so I'm hoping I can help meld all those things together during this discussion. Nice. Uh, King in Yellow. Hi. Um, I hope the fans in my lab aren't overpowering my audio. It's okay. Uh, I'm, a, I'm Alex Rubenstahl. I'm a PhD student uh, at Yale University. I live in the same apartment as Dalton, so we're recording from separate places. <laughs> um, I'm, I, I think what I can bring to this is, uh, much like Dalton and Amelia, kind of a, a researcher perspective, a, a graduate student perspective, but also I think um, how we as paleontologists interact with prospective students, undergraduate researchers, people looking to get into the field. Um, and also I've done a bit of international field work uh, and I can speak to that as well. So South Africa, China, uh, Lesotho, uh, excited to be here. Thank you very much. And uh, last but not least, we have down here, Mr. Dr. Professor Johnston. <laughs> hey, 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 everybody. Uh, my name is Scott Johnston. I am the vertebrate paleontology fossil preparator and technician at the Harvard University Museum of Comparative Zoology. Uh, normally I'd have my camera on, but I am in the middle of helping our invertebrate fossil preparator paint his girlfriend's mom's house. So I look <laughs> like crap. So I won't. But, um, and the perspective I can bring to this is, uh, also the, well, the fossil prep side. The, it is often said that, uh, fossil prep is one of the main gateways into, Uh, into paleontology. It's certainly how I know a lot of researchers got their foot in the door. It's how I got my foot in the door. And so I can talk to you a bit about that. Yeah. Nice. Uh, fantastic. As uh, all viewers hopefully see, we have tried to create a very diverse group from different perspectives, geographically, uh, gender-wise, and so on. Um, now we actually need, would need a very old person in here as well to make it complete, uh, but most old people don't have Discord, so that made it a little bit difficult. Um, otherwise I would have invited Hans Zeus to this, who always is good for, for some nice discussions. Uh, but uh, let's dive right into it. Um, what do you think uh, i we we have a few points here that we, we we will go through but we will see how the discussion overall develops uh, but as a little starter basically uh, what do you guys think is is the current status of uh diversity in paleo and with paleo i mean not just paleontology as a field but all the surrounding sphere that uh, has developed over the past few decades Everybody uh, who has something to say can just uh, go right ahead. I mean, I'll, I'll bite. I'll, I'll jump in on that. Um, I think it's getting better. We definitely still have some pretty glaring um, inequalities, I think, especially race-wise, that every time that we do demographics on this, particularly in the United States, that there's a lot that we haven't done in terms of diversity, that there's a lot of, and that's intertwined with issues of class and privilege and who we see um, in the field. But I feel overall, paleontology, including, you know, the academic side, the surrounding media, art, writing, everything else, it is becoming more diverse. I think the biggest issue we have and what I keep running into every time I give a panel like this is that we have a leaky pipeline problem, right? It is so difficult for people to um, find continued employment or being able to make a living in, in paleontology and get to some of these platforms where we can create the systems that we need, whether it's in terms of needs that we have because of our gender, because we're not neurotypical, whatever it is, I think we keep hitting this barrier where we have a lot of diversity amongst volunteers, students, graduate students, artists, a lot of folks within our community, but getting to the levels where we have the institutional support, I think, to make some of the support systems that we require, that's been the difficult 
part. So it's like, it's getting better, but it also feels like I don't know how to, it's difficult for all of us together to fight some of these systemic issues that have existed for a very long time. So kind of bounce off that for the research perspective, like part of the leaky pipeline problem is that after undergrad, if you're going to pursue research, like the expectation is that you pursue grad school and get a PhD. And a big problem with that, that like myself and some of my friends have had is that you don't get paid to do that always. And not everyone can afford to take out more loans. If you go to undergrad, maybe you can afford that, but you can't afford to continue on. So like a lot of my friends, when we were applying to grad schools, we applied to PhDs right out the gate because they pay you. So you wouldn't have to pay for that. Um, but you might not get a PhD position because they're looking for someone with a master's. Well, most masters you have to pay for. Um, and so that's in my own experience has been a big barrier that I've witnessed firsthand. Um, a lot of talented friends of mine that just haven't gotten into grad school programs because they can't afford to, which is really terrible and shouldn't be the case. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and speaking, oh, sorry, go ahead. I was going to say, um, on the technical side of things, part of that leaky pipeline, uh, if an institution is in any kind of crisis, um, mostly financial, the tech positions are the first ones to get cut alongside exhibit design, alongside art. Um, so it can be, well, I know for a fact that something like the COVID-19 pandemic put a lot of people in my position out of work. So, um, Hey, like me. Yeah. So there aren't very many protections for techs. There aren't very many protections for people to do exhibit design. Uh, the people that are protected are mostly like the administrators or the researchers in those cases, mostly. <laughs> yeah and it's i i think um uh going going a little bit off of that it's it's also a little bit of of a of a shame because uh i i know here in in germany for example looking at the demographic of paleo students we have by now i think equal amounts of male and female students going into paleo but only a tiny bit of that actually makes it into a career because of this leaky pipeline that oftentimes in the long run favors the male colleagues uh, that that then make it to the higher positions or get positions at all. Okay. So I kind of want to touch upon that like from a different perspective. So like in, in my university where I did my bachelor's, like there was this running gag. It was a very sexist gag, but then like there was this whole thing where like a lot of the um males male students would go into the science fields and then a lot of the women students would go into the arts fields and that was like a complete running gag for the university and that was kind of true like you know when you looked at the demograph the demog the demographical sort of like the the student body as well but then there's also this push from people to like go into certain fields like, you know, very, very gender segregated, very stereotypical fields. And that kind of creates that sort of sharp divide. And the sad thing is from where I am, from where I am, like there's also no real um, stage for queer academia or trans academia whatsoever. So that's like, it was just a very unsafe environment even for me to come out back, back then, like even in like I can come out in liberal arts space. That that kind of shows you something about that environment where I was back then. Like now it's a lot better because like my masters I started in a university in Melbourne, and that was very RMIT Melbourne. So they were like really really you know good with all that stuff. But from that perspective, yeah, I can see what you're talking about. I can't see what you're talking about. But then I would say that maybe humanities spaces have a bit more of an even mix. But it's not, it's not like, it's contextual. It's not always clear cut in places where the culture kind of, you know, is, uh, is more suppressive. Yeah, yeah, that's, I, I think yeah. that's true. Uh, like, like uh, that, that's why I appreciate that you are here, Vasi, because you give us a perspective from a ge geographical and cultural perspective that, uh, we sometimes lack over here most of us here are from western developed countries uh and uh that's that's a that's a good uh, point you you make there um something that i sometimes wonder is it is it uh, is this this leaky pipeline is it more like a systematic uh, systemic problem that we face 
or is it oftentimes like big names up the top that basically uh, halt the progress that we already make in the right direction? I think many many people agree on that. Uh, or yeah, or is it a mix of both in a way? I think from a um, a public art background, I can actually add to this a little bit in that there are indeed a lot of system uh, systemic problems that end up cropping up. Um, my public school, college, what so have it, was, you know, a lot of students from lower to middle class incomes. Um, our demographics, we had a lot of women in the programs. Um, we had a lot of less represented groups pop up, but coming out of undergrad, you see a lot of demographic thinning on who gets long-term employment and who simply like, you know, isn't able to find work or, or what so have you. And it was very, very white, for lack of a better term, coming out of things. I have a lot of good friends who are just extremely talented artists who haven't been able to find long-term employment because their financial background or their, or they simply weren't able to find work for whatsoever. Um, so in America, at least, there's definitely a lot of play with that. It's very difficult to to ignore, for lack of a better term. You're right about the whole social oh. class kind of allowing or not allowing you to have a career, a stable career in the arts. To be honest, you're actually very right about that because like there are some art institutes that I know of which are already occupied by very you know. Um, well-off students from very well-off, like financially and socially well-off families, and kind of always manage to get a foot in the door in the design of several creative industries. And a lot of other artists from, like, like, like everywhere else, for example, like from several other sections of class and gender, kind of have to struggle a bit more because even in the fine arts, uh, even in fine arts backgrounds, there can be a very, very it's very stratified. Like there can be a small group on top, basically having a lot of control over a lot of gallery spaces, simply because they're the people who put their products onto the market and into galleries and into shows all the time. And they can be from, you know, they're mostly an urban wealthy group, basically. Like you, you can't really hide that on them. But so, you, so what you're saying is completely true. I can, I can agree to that. I definitely agree. Um, now, you know, I'm in a position, I'm managing a sculpture studio with an exhibitions company right now. Um, and a large majority of this work is through invitation only. There's a huge diversity of people who create amazing art online. You know, there's a large section of the queer community in the paleo field now, especially younger people. Um, I'm seeing a lot of diversity of location as well. Some of my favorite artists come from the Eastern world. Um, and I think it's amazing how we're able to all connect online that way, but every single job experience I've seen in the professional field, now that I've been a part of it for about seven, eight years now, has been fully like, oh, I know this guy, I know this person, I know this person. Um, and once you move out of that, kind of that social media space, and you move into places like conferences where almost all of that work comes from is through making those in-person connections, which they themselves are horribly difficult to get to. You know, I've been in this field for eight years now and I've only been able to afford one conference. And it's getting to that point and finding once you get to these conference spaces, it tends to be higher level people who more often than not are white men in their 50s and 60s. And if yeah. you can't communicate with that older age group there, you know, meet them at the level where they're at, because not always do they want to come down to yours and talk to you about your experiences, you start to reach a lot of roadblocks of how you can kind of break into an institution or a field in that way. Um, you tend to find a lot of people who are like, you know, I've worked with a lot of people who are like, uh, oh yeah, my, my dad did this and they knew this person and so I got this job here and we move forward that way. A lot of the connections I make are through going to places, doing installations at facilities and things like that, meeting artists there and then moving forward to other jobs and doing designs that way. And so you tend to find, while there's such huge diversity in the public arena, 
once you actually start moving into those professional circles, it becomes a lot more difficult to find that diversity there because of that hyper-specific selection of who's being led into this field and who's not. I have to take one step back for a second. When we talk about things being systemic, what I think about is not necessarily like the system or some dean or something like that. You know, I mean, like, I really want to keep these people down or whatever. It's like, it's all these little things that build up, right? It's stuff that make us feel unwelcome and unsupported. And it's difficult to make those changes because often it's on us, right? We're talking about like all the energy that goes into not just doing our career, but improving it for what we need, for what our colleagues need, for what our peers and students need. So it can be something as simple as, for example, anytime I get invited into the field or I go, there should be a code of conduct and information about like if something happens, if you are harassed, if you are made to feel uncomfortable, whatever it is, this is who you talk to, this is what our system is for it, this is how we take care of it. It is a basic safety procedure. It takes only a little bit of work to do and almost nobody does it. And things like that, they begin to push people out of the field, right? Especially in a field where traditionally it's been very white and very male and very cisgendered and generally older field camps are often run almost like summer camps, even in academic settings. If you have a need that you need a special accommodation for or is a little bit different in order to do your work, there's often pressure to get it done at whatever cost, regardless of how your brain works or what your personal needs are. So it's all these little things together where the people that we're talking to, they might not even realize that they're part of the problem, right? I remember being in the field once in Nevada and I was making, helping dinner and like washing up and the PI on the trips was talking to a student saying like, I believe that science is basically as close to an actual meritocracy as you can possibly get. And I almost like dropped the plate because it's just like, what? With all the constant you know, inequalities that we see, this is not just about merit. This is not just about like, are you putting out the best paper or doing the best research or having the best idea? There are all these other things. And I feel like that's part of the difficulty, right? Is that the people who are here are most likely to already kind of be on the same page as us. It's how we reach these other folks that seem to have this impression that you rise to the top of our actually very small field through just the quality of your work. And I think that is part of this as well. It makes it more challenging, right? Is that we only have this relatively small number of positions. A lot of people who are in professorships and curatorships and sort of positions of prominence now they're about my age. They're like, you know, they're like older millennials, maybe Gen X or whatever. And they're going to be in those positions for quite a while. So they're kind of taking up, you know, that ecological space in a sense. So how do we increase the diversity and support within a field in which we're kind of saturated at the moment? And it takes almost generational turnover to make some of these changes, especially when these diversity initiatives or what we need often come down to what we as individuals do or might be doing our individual institutions. I was talking to another panel the other day and the students were asking, where are the resources or their societies or things I can go to? And it's like, well, there kind of aren't. There are a few or they might be institution by institution. But the thing is, we are already overtaxed and we have to create these initiatives amongst ourselves. So I'm not entirely sure how we get beyond this, but that's kind of what I see from, from my perspective is that the systemic nature of this is not necessarily people wanting to say like, I'm anti-diversity, but there's a lot of ignorance, honestly, and belief that in science that you rise to whatever position because of how good you are. And we know that that's not true, but it's difficult to, to change that. Absolutely. A considering lot, right. what yeah, you no. sometimes see published. I just want to add on in terms of, uh, what was that? Um, I just want to add on, um, I think a big portion to, um, in terms of like when we're talking about these issues, I think a big part is a little bit reflective of academia as a whole. Um, it's just that it gets compartmentalized within paleontology and we see it like very, very clearly um, when you're talking about uh, the demographics of who's where and what they're doing. Um, I think it's especially sober when you look at parts of the world, like when, when we bring in economics, for instance, I think it's especially sober when you look at parts of the world, like, um, like for anywhere throughout the global south, like if it's in Africa or in uh, most of Latin America, uh, I think it's uh, sober when you see, like for instance, like populations where it's like it's primarily black and other indigenous peoples, but um, in terms of who's representing paleontology or who's representing uh, a lot of these uh, positions that are that to describe a lot of these things it's 
only white cis hetero males that you find in these positions and i think it's uh it's uh funny in a way and not not uh, the haha funny but funny in a way it was like interesting how that is what the norm is and whenever you do see whenever you do see uh you know uh publications come out from them there's the added uh, fact that a lot of the people that helped out in these places uh whether it be in the excavations whether it be in the descriptions whether it be in just general like housing and even things like that don't uh, not don't always get the flowers in, in that regards but um bringing it back to the academic space um uh, like Riley was bringing up earlier, um, I think it's uh, a good amount of it is a lot of these little uh, little things that build up. And when you do have students, for instance, that um, aren't a, 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 a thought of or accommodated for when uh, a lot of these things are put out in terms of like workload that aren't taking into account the economic backgrounds of a lot of these people, a lot of these students that might have to uh, compensate for that economic uh, positions with more uh, taking care of more work uh, outside of school or um, having more weight on their shoulders that, than they usually have than the average person um, in these fields you know and uh, it, it, it does show up you, know, you do you do tend to see that um, like once you start noticing it, it is getting better slowly through time but um, I definitely do think that there is a disparity between for instance like with black people and uh, people throughout most of the global south um in terms of like representation in a lot of these fields like we, we could even talk about um uh for instance like a lot of these meetings for instance like uh, a lot of these conferences and whatnot like i think uh, it's uh, it's interesting how a lot of the time uh these things only happen within a lot of the uh major western centers of the world so when you really have them happening and whether it be in say toronto uh, new york Brand in Paris and all these other places and whatnot, but there isn't really any attempt to really open arms or invite people from other parts of the world and make it economically easier for them to get access to these parts. And of course, there are political aspects to it that play into it, but I do think that a lot of it could be opened up a little bit more than already currently is. Absolutely uh, agree. Uh, oh, wait, let's, uh, yeah, I, I have something, but let's, uh, Grace first. I was going to say, um, even if we had this little thought experiment where academia was a perfectly meritocratic system, um, I, I've just noticed that a lot of us here happen to be living in the States. And we have a couple of systems that work against people entering a hypothetical, purely meritocratic system. One of the chief ones being healthcare. Because uh, if your workplace does not hire you for enough hours or cannot provide you with health care, you're going to have to seek that elsewhere. That is not a thing that is guaranteed to you as an American. I, I can feel all the Europeans, all the Australians, everybody who's outside of the U.S. cringing right now. Um, and that is another major filter, but it's one that exists kind of divorced from the academic space, from the workplace, kind of. So... There are multiple filters that remove potential people from this field. Absolutely. Uh, yeah, like when we were thinking about potential guests that we want to, to include, we were also like, yeah, we. I think it would be good to have a few people of color on this. That uh, should be a no-brainer. But then we were saying, okay, but who? And the list was shockingly short. Uh, of of people we could invite, and uh, I I think that it's 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 you are so slapped in the face with with how much these different kinds of filters are leading to this fa how, how paleo is perceived oftentimes also on uh, in in the public because of of stuff like this. Um, yeah, and not to mention, um, on top of that, Yashua, given our time zone that we're trying to work in, yes. there's simply people who are in the middle of the night right now who are that is, that dead is asleep. True. As much as we would love to have a lot more people from around the world, when you approach somebody who is asleep at this time, it gets very difficult to, you know, get them in yeah. for this kind of event. I'm, I'm sorry for many people yeah, from Asia and, right and Australia. <laughs> so what I was trying to say was like about the perception of paleontology like in South Asian, Southeast Asian region, there really isn't 
that much even though we have really great um you know even though there are really great paleontological like deposits there are great deposits in india and in like many places like in this region but then there's no real care going towards it because there's not a lot of even though there are like maybe state universities there's not a lot of money being poured into education it's all poured into other government expenses like policing and like just essentially violence border control policing racism and like whatever you can think of it's not really poured into where it's needed in education or government healthcare so like there is a massive gap so even the students from underprivileged backgrounds who would like to get into these fields and like actually enjoy this sort of thing like there's no way of doing so and even in india for example even though there is there are amazing fossils in india like amazing mesozoic fossils in india but most of them are just left in the rock and not really collected because there's nowhere to really store them plus there's no incentive to for indian paleontologists like you know really dig there because again no funding given to indian institutions even though there are quite a few where you can learn that stuff but regardless like without the incentive and without like without anyone able to join in and without any viable career options there it's like there's really no point for them to continue for people to continue working in those areas at yeah. least from my understanding and over here there is like 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 you like we were talking Joshua, like about the civilic fossils like you said okay that narrows it down and uh, yeah it's there is stuff but with no pub- no real public perception towards that and no real funding towards education towards you know state universities i'm a product of a state university there was not a lot of money given to our education like th- there were a few small like you know small payments given to certain students who requested a payment to like live off or for to study off of like a few resources but it was still never really enough to support an individual student so it it's still it's there's still a huge gap there's still a huge gap like probably throughout much of this region to be honest like and i'm taking it in like one big conglomerate whereas like regional wise and country wise it's going to be different but then we all, we all know where the money really is going and it's not into like education whatsoever yeah a uh, subsequent uh, i mean we we talked about this yesterday too it it even uh begins to break with simple stuff like log- logistics there's so little little money that even storage pay- space oftentimes doesn't exist so many important fossils can't be collected or even properly s- stored which then leads of course to all the problems that uh tropical climate can bring with it and and fossils so uh yikes uh sometimes there something that that riley brought up earlier and that i uh, would like to expand upon is uh before we go into maybe more horrible personal stories also hi cat um uh, uh like do you have like like uh personal stories or do you know about interesting initiatives and projects that are trying to to go against these uh, systemic pro- or sometimes even personal problems um yeah oh, so uh oh, i'm sorry <laughs> uh yeah i do have a personal story um and i meant to mention this earlier but another issue uh with some people getting into grad school is just sometimes you have advisors that can be a little problematic and this was something funny, <laughs> funny enough literally happened like what like a month ago to me or at least well it's been happening for the majority of my masters i mean when i i'm not going to name drop but when i first entered uh when i first had my advisory meeting uh my advisor basically told me uh it's going to be an uphill battle working with me because i don't believe in your hypothesis it's like okay <laughs> and like you know and like there's other stuff where he was basically being really complicated with me didn't want me to do my own project And at first I thought it was because of this hypothesis I had. And then later I realized um, after getting a really nasty comment, like he's basically literally like gaslighting me. He's like, oh, but we agreed to this. I'm like, well, obviously I didn't. And when I submitted my grant application, I got this like really nasty email. 
several emails actually. Um, thankfully now everything's civil because I met with the head of the master. By the way, this is a tip. If you have an advisor that's being nasty to you, uh, you find out whoever is in charge and then you have a meeting with all of you together to get things settled. And that's what I did. And thankfully now things are civil. Uh, I haven't had any problems, but you know, like the, what's unfortunate is that this was a person who I used to think was really, really cool. And now like, don't meet your heroes guys. Cause now it's like, I was oh. about to say, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's true. It's sometimes really true. Yeah. I'm kind of, this is kind of what I wanted to speak on before, but so in my interactions with kind of undergraduates who are interested in pursuing research, a lot of the time, one of the filters that ends up sorting them out is problematic faculty. And this can range anywhere from like people who are, are committing criminal acts to people who are just kind of bullying people out of the field, which is not, I don't mean to kind of play that down. And part of this issue is that within our field, at, at least in my experience, uh, there's kind of, there are people who are quietly acknowledged to be uh, severely problematic and kind of everyone is aware of it. And it simply persists. And that's not just, that's not just researchers. This extends to like uh, people who do SCICOM. There are people who are known to be problematic in paleo SCICOM. There, there are really at every level. And, you know, if, if a student who's, who's worked so hard to fight against all these, these previous filters, they can, they can make it and then just, just be ground out by some of these people. And these are people who have essentially established robust public faces for themselves uh, and who are often quite well known and quite popular. Uh, and they, it can kind of engender this feeling of, of despair and hopelessness in people who, who find themselves downstream of that. Um, and it's just, I mean, some of these people have been working for 20 or 30 years and just everyone knows and nothing happens. Yeah. And like it's, the issue or the, I guess the reason why nothing happens, like I can speak to like knowing friends who've had to deal with problematic people who hold positions of power. You're, if you're an undergrad and you're being bullied by someone who has 20, 30 years experience in the field and has a name for themselves and a lab and money and resources, you could end your career by speaking out against them if no one believes you. And if you're an undergrad who, who nobody knows, because this is kind of such a, a who you know kind of field, that that could be it you could tank yourself uh, by outing them i think the the like in terms of academics and in terms of kind of trying to break down the filters of, of keeping academia from being diverse the advisor system is one of those really big filters and 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 josh it kind of gets to the question you're asking of like like how much is controlled by the system versus individual people and i mean obviously the system's made up of individual people but there are there are barriers to entry that we're facing, not just in paleo, but like across the geosciences, that that active work is being done to try to fix. But one of the big barriers that I think faculty doesn't like to to uh, to kind of take a look at is like how, as a faculty member, are you putting yourself out there as an advisor, and how actually are you as an advisor? If people want to to go down this academic route, you know, the the advisor advisee relationship is one of the most important ones for building that early stage of the career, and. A lot of people have to make a lot of uh, hard choices about, you know, I'd love to go to this program, they have all the resources I want, but this advisor is either known to be toxic, or even if they're unknown, like if, if you're someone whose identity doesn't intersect with the identity of your advisor, you have to ask yourself, is this going to be a safe place for me? Is this going to be a safe person for me to work with? Are they going to respect me and my needs? And the answer is is not abundantly clear all the time. Not to mention now, especially, I mean, around the world it's a problem, but in the U.S. especially, like, is this going to be a place I can go to and have all my needs met? Is this going to be a safe place for me beyond just the academic environment? And so that's, it's a huge barrier, I think, to academia, and it's not an easy one to solve. And I don't, unfortunately, have the answers, but it's, you know, one that we have to contend with. Yeah, and it's like, it's feels... right? sorry. Oh. sorry, go ahead. No, go. Oh, I, I was just gonna say it feels weird to me like I feel because of discussions like this because what I hear from what friends have been through I feel lucky that I had advisors who are decent people which is just an insane thing to feel lucky for that like I yeah. just happened to because I when I went to undergrad I was not in paleo at all 
and I just so happened to wind up out of place with an advisor who was helpful and honest with me and told me when I was applying to grad schools, don't go there because that person's a bad person or don't go there because they're going to they do this kind of thing. And like not everybody has that. And it's just it's all bad. You run into a lot as well. You know, I've I got in the past into a situation where I was working on a project and I we had to put the project on hold because every single person I spoke to about the project said, oh, maybe don't work with this person because we don't like how they do this or maybe don't work with this person because we don't like how they do that. And I got kind of stuck for a little bit because it was like, well, is it a personal issue or is it a professional issue going on? Because a very large thing that happens to overlap is personal and professional, especially in a field as small as this and as personal as it is to a lot of us, there's not a boundary there. Um, so having professional versus personal issues tend to overlap and you get situations like that where you're told, you know, oh, you know, don't work with this person don't do that. And it's like, when you boil down to it, you know, it's like, oh, 20 years ago, they told me they don't like the color of my socks. And it's like, okay, why, why is that still an issue, you know, type thing. Um, and so you get into that. And then I've also encountered a lot. It is very lucky to have an advisor. I had someone at my last position who wanted nothing more than to see the success of the following generations and see these, um, this diversity of the expanded minds enter this field. That was one colleague. Many other colleagues I've dealt with also are just very like, I just want to do my research. I just want to be here, do my thing. I don't want to stand up to this. It's going to make waves. It's going to do all that. Um, and so there's not a lot of room where people feel empowered to break down some of these personal versus professional barriers. And so setting up ways that we can safely interact with people and do those and kind of help um, I've lost the word there, but really just make sure that we have avenues together and supportive of each other to help get past these things. Like you were saying, Tess, having a mediator, having something like that where we can tackle these issues. Yeah, that's part of the struggle, right? Because this discipline, it's built upon volunteer labor. It's built upon the labor of students. Basically, we have a small number of people who, whether they recognize it or not, and I'm not saying it's outwardly malicious, but they're profiting from the labor of all these other people. And we're often treated like this is this meat grinder, right? That you get into the academic pipeline and you move along and you, you know, you do your thesis, your dissertation, and, you know, your advisor ever has an authorship on it and has to do with their research program and all this stuff. It's set up from the beginning that you're already on your back foot as soon as you start to get into it. Well, it's as a positive step or something to do. And like, I'm glad that you brought this up, Tess. Was, um, it really sucks that we have to do this, right? But knowing your universities, your institutions' policies, um, knowing things like Title IX protections, knowing who the department chair is, um, if your university has an ombudsman, um, things like that, where when something goes out, because we're not told this stuff, right? We usually have to piece it together like in the moment or when, when something happens and by then you're you're in it and that's part of the culture change that i would like to see especially amongst these problematic folks who like are going to maintain their positions of power and it breaks my heart that even in this conversation there are some people that we know that we can't even say what their names are that the whisper network is real and i'm sure we can put it together in a second who these folks are and yet we still yeah, have to you, be worried and watch our backs about this mind. stuff right <laughs> Yeah, yeah, somebody who shares a name with the Puss and Boots villain, amongst others, yeah. Um, so there's all this stuff that's out there, and we know it, right? And yet, we need to protect ourselves. And stuff as simple as normalizing things, like if you're going into the field asking, what is our code of conduct? What is our safety manual? Who do we talk to? And... Again, I, I wish it were otherwise that we didn't have to do this, but I feel like as much as we can kind of, if there's something at the university or institutional level that kind of gives us some protection, being knowledgeable about that and transmitting that information, because, you know, it's one of those things, I forget what the exact phrase is, but, you know, like sunlight is the best disinfectant. The more that we're aware and the more that we can put these things sort of in the open and bring it to somebody else, bring it to a mediator, it's not always going to work. But that's one of the things that's so difficult about this is that all these sort of negative things are happening, but so often they go unreported um, because we don't feel the institutions have our back and that's its own issue. So 
having our support systems, whether it's within that institution, whether it's our friends, our family, or the communities that we belong to. I wish we had more tangible steps, but I guess that's still where we're at. It's building these basic and building and normalizing these basic, basically like emergency breaks that we can tell everybody are there so we don't feel so isolated and alone yeah. when we come ac across these barriers. Yeah, no, I absolutely agree. Um, uh, who, who wanted to say? What? Uh, yeah, it's ah, me. Yeah. Um, so uh, on one of the things that Riley brought up there um, real fast is an area that I find incredibly frustrating for bringing people into this field is the aspect that, yeah, it is built off of volunteer labor, which is such a ridiculously huge stumbling block for so many people. Like, uh, the only way that I was able to get my original fossil prep job at the AMNH was because I was 24 and I had a decade's worth of experience working in fossil prep labs because I started at 14. And I was only able to start <laughs> volunteering. I was only able to start, like, like volunteering for four years um, before uh, I, I got into college uh, because I didn't have to work for money. My parents didn't weren't saying, like, hey, you got to help some, pay some bills now that you actually can work a job. Uh, I could just spend my summers in a fossil prep lab. And then when I got to the University of Michigan, we had enough funding for 20 paid student hours per week, and that's it. And we had a huge number of people that wanted to work there. And the best solution that we could come up with was, okay, let's divide this money down as far as we could go so more people can at least get something. And that is a hard thing that I'm trying to fight against uh, at Harvard right now is that like, I have the capacity to have like eight or nine people working with me in my fossil prep lab right now, but we do not have funding to do that. So either they're working for free, which means that they are essentially going to be self-selecting as they're going to be uh, like straight cis white guys, because that's where generational wealth is or I'm going to be able to have like one volunteer and that's it. Or, or, or sorry, one, one student who we get paid who might even be like, all right, we can fund you for a month and a half. And it's so frustrating because it's something that we could so clearly change if we just had the funding to do so. Yeah. I, so when I was at Harvard last week visiting Scott and the collections, I was talking to the hey. uh, Chris, Christina's collections manager, right? Technically. Um, uh, yeah, she is. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so we were we were talking about exactly this, and it's not obviously it's not that Harvard doesn't have the money for it; they just don't do it. Like she was telling me that they yeah like they're not allowed to have like paid interns. They're not allowed to have volunteers from the community which is a big thing in a lot of other places I've been to. So like the AMNH, for example, I'll go into collections and there's folks there that are just from the community. They're older, they have normal day jobs and all that, but they just come spend an hour or two a week at the AMNH organizing fossils or helping out in the prep lab or whatever it is. And that was just insane to me because like also like at my undergrad, like that was one of the benefits is that we could also just volunteer in the prep lab as students and you didn't have to be a paleo student. You just had to reach out and say, hey, I want to spend an hour a week getting experience and like hands-on experience is so important in this field for all of the subfields for prep and communication and research and everything that like the fact that a place like Harvard has it's a single it's like you and Christine are the only full-time employees right Oof. in the paleo department for, for staff uh, yeah yes actually it, it <laughs> is it is just us two and then we have uh we have a care well for for VP it's us too right. we have um we have uh, to an IP as well, and then the curators. We're even though it's Harvard, we're a very small museum. Yeah, it's just absurd on all levels. Yeah, uh, short short thing. Uh, we are time wise already in the intermission. I love the discussion. Uh, maybe we can open it uh, after Grace comment a little bit up to to uh, like people uh, having questions and stuff or or comments. Um, of, of their own stories or maybe a positive experiences too that would be nice for once um, uh, but I'm quickly going to the toilet you continue I will be back in a second 
I'll take up the uh, the responsibility of moderation, though I don't really think we need some. Everything's everything's been very pleasant so far, and I'm very happy with the way this has been turning out. Uh, just another little disclaimer: at well, in 20 minutes sharp, we're going to be pivoting to our next uh, guest speaker. So 20 minutes, but uh, no rush. But I was One going thing to I wanted to ask everybody. No oh, go ahead. Sorry, I stepped on your words. Uh, I was going to, uh, yes, and this discussion about volunteer labor. Um, institutions relying exclusively on volunteer labor are also creating a situation where expertise is something that's going to be very, very hard to get and maintain. Uh, volunteers as a whole tend to be either transient or they don't spend nearly as many hours uh, as somebody who is in a full-time paid position. So developing expertise, developing the breadth of knowledge required to handle difficult projects, um, developing the fine motor skills, that's all something that is halted by using majority or exclusively volunteer labor. And that's unfair to the volunteers, putting them in charge of a project that might be beyond their level. It's unfair to the researchers uh, because they're relying on somebody turning in a completed prep project in what may be an unreasonable amount of time for their skill level. So it's just unfair on all levels for an institution to be mostly using volunteer labor. If you're going to have people doing labor for your scientists, pay them. I wanted to throw this out to the group. Like we've been talking a lot about academic and field spaces, but a lot of us, like we're very much online. Like we mostly know each other and stuff from, from Twitter and Instagram and other things like that. And I don't know about you all, but I know like sometimes just being visible as somebody who is part of a marginalized group, like you run into stuff. So I was wondering like, how do we show up better for each other or build that better community in online spaces for where a lot of the paleo art and outreach and writing and things like that are is it because i feel like it's often like you know if we run into something negative we can block and report and things like that um but i'm not sure what everybody else's experience is if we feel very much like kind of out on our own or if there are ways in which that you know if we see someone making a nasty comment on your thread or whatever else like if there's something that we can do or some support that we can offer because so much of this is outside the academic realm as well and it involves people who like might love dinosaurs but that might be the only thing that we have in common uh so i i feel like, like okay so for me even though most of the stuff that i see is on twitter or instagram or on discord like i think i sometimes catch up really really late because much, much of it happens when I'm asleep. So it's just time zones. So much of it happens when I'm asleep. But then if someone really needs to like, like bring something up and if I like have been acquainted with them through regular discussion or something like that, like I just like talk to them or like, you know, try to relate to them. Because again, for me personally, like the years in paleontology were my first actual queer community technically because I sort of like, that was like several years ago actually because like in that was a time when in sri lanka the lgbt community locally was just starting to get mainstream so there wasn't much of a thing back then when i was say about seven, 16 or 17 like that like when i was just realizing kind of who i was and paleontology at that time like you know we had a few facebook groups and that kind of boiled over into Twitter and then into Discord and then kind of became what it is right now in terms of like, you know, the paleo stream and all that. So I think that was how I got to know a lot of people. And then I just, I just get really close with people. So I just like talk to them or if I see someone like going through something, I might like, you know, try to talk to them or more personally, like not really make it massively out there. Because again, I miss a lot of things because I'm asleep. But all I can do is just talk personally. I, I, I guess that's where I'm coming from because, like, it's, it's sort of what happens. And, like, a lot of people also just reach out to me to, like, you know, talk to me about their problems, whether, whether they are part of the community or not, online or not. So it's just, just looking for people to listen to them. And that kind of boils into, you know, becoming friends with them and just being there for someone. So 
I think that's more of like a general thing as well. I'm going to more general stuff as well. But yeah, that does happen. That does happen a lot. Again, because of time zones, I catch up late. <laughs> I definitely agree. Um, a lot of times I'll see stuff online where it's like, oh, I I have an answer for you, but that happened 14 hours ago. So it's like, I don't know if it has to be brought back up again, you know? Um, I find a really big thing is remaining approachable. Um, there's a lot of barriers online and things like that where it's like, you know, oh, you know, can I talk to this person? Can I do this sort of thing? And it's really just being an open voice. Um, I know when I publicly came out for a lot of people, um, I'm very passing. You know, I'm very much a gay man, but I'm very much also a cis gay man. And so I had a lot of people approach me and be like, hey, you know, I feel like I can talk to you like dude to dude. And like as prob as problematic as that can be in its own certain way, it still created an opportunity where a lot of my coworkers and peers were like, we've had these these questions about how engaging the queer community and things and making it more comfortable for them in this space, you know, they felt comfortable in that way to approach me and be like, you know, how can we work towards this, you know? And that then becomes that space where it's well, I, you know. I don't have all those answers. And so let's bring in other people to help answer that sort of question. And so remaining an open, public, friendly face to help uh, kind of make these things start up, make them happen. And so creating opportunities for people to do that, I think is a very good first step of, you know, I recognize a lot of people in here are public queer faces as well. And so, you know, what you're doing, just being queer and in your field is one of those first steps to helping introduce some of this greater uh, diversity and sources and being a person of color doing the same sort of thing showing like you know i come from an area of the world where 80 percent of everyone was white and so it's like you know it's really cool to see now in online spaces seeing you know a diversity of people a diversity of cultures coming forward and getting to broaden your perspective that way. And so having those open forums of discussion to help bring those people forward really helps. To that point, that's kind of why I think a couple weeks ago, months ago, I don't remember. Um, I made a little bit of a point of sharing, at least on Twitter, that I am ace because I feel like that's something that a lot of people don't recognize or see or think about, really. Or you might not even realize that that's something that you can be. And you just might be wondering why everyone around you thinks about things so differently. <laughs> um, so, yeah, to, to uh, amplify what you said of just being kind of visible, even if it's in a little way, like so that people know they can reach out to you to just ask about what it may, may be like and how you feel about it and figure out things for themselves. Uh, yeah, yeah I think think I'm I'm most, most oh, oh, thoughts of time. things from my own life online, so it's like, yeah, I kind of yeah. just came out in a huge way, so I can completely relate to what you're saying, like, you know, just being visible. And most of the things that I get in terms of work and things to talk about in Sri Lanka, like the state of trans rights here and what whatnot, like, I get just because I'm there, just because I'm, like, out there very publicly. So it, it, it kind of boils over, it kind of boils over in a, in a very weird way. Um, I was gonna say it's also important to uh, create um, as much as much as you physically can, like tangibly can, uh, some sort of support uh, support system for one another. Once you do find each other in that community, um, I can say at least from a black perspective that there's not that many of us in these circles. So it's very important, at least for me, to reach out and when I do find somebody and see like in what ways can we make sure that we've got each other's backs if something does come along, whether it's in our academic circles or it's online or uh, in artists, like artistic uh, realms, you know, um, it's important to do that because if you do come across a major problem and it is uh, one that is, for instance, like particularly academic, it is, it, it does feel sometimes, uh, it, it can be daunting, like to, approach it feeling like you're the only person that's really like there and you're essentially the central head of the problem but nobody else is around you to help you like address it you know um 
So that that's a that's a I think a, a major one, uh, not just even emotionally but materially. How can we? Uh, I think that's a big question. Like in general, like not even just within that perspective. How can we support each other in uh, emotional and uh, material ways in order to make a lot of these issues uh, a lot easier to handle and even address in the first place? You sometimes like end up give from a, a different. This, this trans perspective i will say that sometimes yeah, i end up giving advice on hrt and good good endocrinologists to people who are just coming on to start the transition process because there's no real uh streamlining of that of that process or like no real not, not a lot of information being given out so it's like we all just tend to hear things down the grapevine and when there's when there's a majority community that is very closeted you kind of need to hear things a lot more privately and conduct your business a lot more personally sometimes in person as well on uh, to in person meetups but then like where there is there are a lot of people who are closeted because of a danger coming up because of a danger of being like you know maybe out of their houses or like losing their work work uh, because of transphobic or homophobic employers it's like kind of imperative that you sort of you know give those safety measures at least from where i'm coming from in a much more low down sort of like sort of like a much more discreet manner and sort of like recognizing how you can like you know uh i just lost my train of thought <laughs> how you can like you know manage to maybe keep giving on you know that sort of support to them either individually or through like you know another group that you can direct them to Oh. And we're, we're all being out there, but one of the best things we can do that I love to do as well is signal boost, right? Just retweet or share or talk about other people's stuff, and that helps build the community, right? And so many of us, like, we make things, whether it's art or books or stickers or we're promoting a project or whatever it is. Like, it's not just us being out there, but, like, the more, like it costs nothing to reshare something. And that's something I want to put out there as well for anybody who's, you know, in this panel or listening, if you've got something cool or you could use a signal boost or share it like please let me know i feel like it's that kind of stuff where it's like if you can just send somebody a note if you've got that community and then all of you can start sharing it that's how we start getting the visibility beyond i think what's sort of we feel individually responsible for and we start building you know the, these threads that bring more people in i think that's a really good point on the um on the publication and aspect of that, I, for those who don't know, I work at National Geographic. I'm a graphics editor, um, but we do, you know, there, we always have contractors and everybody in the business does. So like, if you do know people in, in paleo art and et cetera, who are, you know, like who are doing great work, but maybe aren't like working professionally, it's always worth it to bring up those people and you can help up, you can help bring people into that space just by recommending them for projects that you're working on if it comes up. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think and, just, oh, sorry. Uh, yeah, uh, in, a, in a second. Uh, as, as much I think something that, that Riley brought up earlier, as much as I like uh, stuff like like the Whisper Network and everything, it also feeds in a way a little bit into this this inherent nepotism that the wolf field has. So it it would be cool to if it wasn't necessary, if if we could do these things a little more open, especially when it comes to like who best to avoid and stuff, I think stuff like a uh, code of conduct and everything is a good step into the the right direction. We discussed this last year at the EAVP meeting, who also is now getting a code of conduct, uh, although it's much smaller than the uh, SVP, but we saw the necessity for that. Uh, but also something that was brought up there, code of conduct is also just the first step oftentimes, because after that the bigger one comes, that the institutions have to be held accountable to these code of conduct, which is oftentimes more difficult uh, because of that nepotism and and stuff like that. Uh, yeah, uh, now King in yellow. <laughs> yeah, just kind of because we're discussing possible possible uh, avenues to, to kind of build support amongst our communities. Um, and earlier it was material, uh, discussed that these are also like, these are material issues as well. And while this won't apply to everyone, like worker collectivization and unionizing is important. Like it's like, it's good to signal boost and it's good to show support, but like 
a lot of a lot of the filters especially to the higher levels are economic um and like just having some kind of health care or being able to to write like a, a collective graduate student union or even artists I, I was thinking a little bit of earlier about kind of you know how how can how can employees incentivize those that are 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 paying are, are paying for them to avoid like you know ai stuff right how much how much of paleo art is going to be subsumed by artificial intelligence what can we do to defend that and and there are there are ways for worker organization to help organize against it and i, th I think that that is a really practical and important line of of investment in terms of our energy and you know a union is built by us. It it, it would offer us a, a a space that's not just you know those those people who are established in the field for thirty years. And you know, I, just 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 my thoughts on that. Good thoughts. And um, also, we are coming to the end of our of our discussion here. Just a couple of minutes away from our next talk. Um, just want to make sure we have plenty of time to pivot and. Uh, get Natalia ready for for their talk. So, if there's any like closing words or final statements anybody here wants to make, we'd be happy to hear them. Um, I I think I have one more thing uh, overall to just add in. I think um a big part um also that needs to be taken into consideration. I, I know we spoke a lot about um we spoke a lot about how. Uh, these fields, at least currently in terms of visibility, are predominantly white. Um, and that does have its own material uh, realities. But I do think uh, an aspect of it that does need to be considered is also culturally, what does that mean for a lot of how uh, we're engaging with these things? Because of course, we understand that scientific racism is a thing that is very well rooted in the fields that, and specifically in these fields um in stem in general but in these fields in particular and i come to think about uh, anthropology for instance and paleoanthropology as being like the biggest ones um in terms of like how visible a lot of these things are um i think a big part that needs to be considered is how are we engaging with a lot of these topics that we are come like that we love for instance um like i'm, I'm still reading papers uh, published this year um particularly like if I go to anthropological papers where they're describing uh describing like for instance like Mbuti people like in the Congo as pygmies which is slow like it's not something that uh, you would expect I, I was I was genuinely taken aback when I saw that um, a few uh, a few weeks ago but there's, there's plenty of language like that that um you know uh, pops up a lot of the time and it reflects in the way that uh, a lot of researchers interact and uh, I think also by proxy a lot of uh, enthusiasts interact with um, whether it be groups of people or uh, the non-human in general. I think uh, it does become very, very evident. And I think that's something that we do need to take into account and uh, break down and criticize uh, whenever we can and trying to reflect as to how we are engaging with these things as opposed to just, you know, freely going about it, uh, about it with uh, little to no uh, consideration as to what the larger implications are. That, that was the last thing I wanted to add in. Very much agreed. Ed? Ooh. Oh, I was just going to say, I would like to say the biggest thing, um, I got in a lot of trouble a lot of times at my last job for speaking up against some of these things. I'll say flat out, I worked for a Mormon-controlled Republican government city. Um, and so there were a lot of things there that came with that um and so it was speaking out against some of those institutionalized issues and while in the beginning it became very rough um you get that support you know coworkers stand up with you things happen if you are that voice it encourages other people to support that voice as well and so while it's not always you know a smooth ride you know you do have the ability to make change and you do have the ability to make things better, not just for yourself, but for your peers and other people around you. And so if you have that opportunity, um, either use your voice to give platform to these things, or if you don't have the expertise on that voice, use your platform to give that expertise that platform. Share what you can with others. And then if, if there's a voice more qualified to speak on something like that, it's okay to also amplify that voice with them as well. 
Very right, good and, closing um, war. We have hit our time limit here. Yeah, yeah. Uh, perfectly. <laughs> Beautiful. I thank you, everyone, in the discussion. Uh, and people also on, on Twitch and uh, Discord who left uh, very nice comments here. Um, yeah, uh, I think this was a quite nice discussion. Uh, I'm very. Uh, if you have any feedback afterwards, I would love to hear it. Um, in general, for everybody who is here um, on Twitch or Discord, if you have feedback on how we handled this discussion or the conference overall, would love to hear it because we would love to do this again in the future. Uh, so yeah, this brings us to our next speaker. Natalia, are you here? Yeah, can you see me? Yes. 